Thank you for that scripture reading. All right, how many David daily Bible readers do we have? All right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. All right, fourteen. All right, give thanks always, like the scripture reading said. I think that's what a lot of us have been doing. And uh, over the last uh, week, I think most of us probably have participated in some way in in uh, uh, Thanksgiving, and I remember uh, in school there was always a lesson that was part of our uh, lesson about Thanksgiving, where Thanksgiving came from, and you know, uh, throughout history it was uh, actually rather common, it'll turn on in a minute if it's blinking, uh, it's rather common uh, throughout our, uh, for there to be days of Thanksgiving in our country, and it wasn't until Lincoln proclaimed it a national holiday that we have Thanksgiving as we know it. So this morning I want to think a little bit about the act of thanksgiving. And you know the Bible tells us in many different ways to give thanks. In everything, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 says, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ concerning you. Philippians 4, 6 says, with thanksgiving let your requests be made known uh, to God. The Psalms repeatedly say, uh, give thanks to the Lord for He... Good. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15 says to offer a sacrifice of praise that is the fruit of our lips that gives thanks to his name. Now why are we instructed to give thanks? Think about that for a minute. Does God need our thanksgiving? You know Acts chapter 17 uh, says that God is not served by human hands as though he needed anything. In other words, there isn't really anything that he needs from us. So why do we need to give thanks? I'm convinced that it has more to do with us than it does to do with God, that the benefit in thanksgiving, um, the benefit is for us rather than for God. And we're going to be looking this morning at Romans chapter 1, so if you want to take your Bibles and turn there. And as we read through this, you may think this, be, this to be a uh, strange passage to read in connection with Thanksgiving, but that will become clear as we go along. Romans chapter 1, beginning with verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God... They neither glorified God, glorified Him as God, nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being, and birds, and animals, and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who was forever praised. Amen. And because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned their natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty of, for their error. Therefore, or furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to depraved mind, so that they do what ought not to be done. They become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding. 
No fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. What a passage to read in connection with Thanksgiving. But I know, think you notice in there uh, that uh, in this particular passage, it does mention the giving of thanks at one point. Professing to be wise, they became fools when they, when they turned their backs on God. Why? There were two things they did not do. Number one, the text says they didn't honor God as God. And number two, they didn't give thanks to God. How might things have been different from the description that we read here had they given thanks to God? So once again, I want to suggest that Thanksgiving is more for us than God. Giving thanks, thanksgiving as a lifestyle can transform you. We're going to look at several ways from the text here. Number one, go ahead and advance. Uh, number one, it can transform our perception. In other words, when we give thanks, we get a more correct view of ourselves and get a more correct view of who we are. This passage reminds us of this. We are the creatures. We are the created ones, and He is the Creator. And those who didn't honor God as God, those who didn't give thanks to Him, uh, forgot that or rejected idea, uh, rejected that idea. We are the creatures, the created ones. What does it mean to be creaturely? You know, the Bible says, "In Him we live and move and have our being." That's in Acts chapter 17. In other words, we cannot exist. We can't even uh, uh, live, we can't breathe, we can do nothing without the one who created us. In other words, we are not independent beings. We owe our existence and we are dependent completely on God. Being creaturely also means that we are corruptible. God is incorruptible, but we are corruptible. Romans chapter 3 says there is none righteous not even one, and that all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 5 and verse 6 says, While we were weak, Christ died for the ungodly. Some Bible said, While we were helpless, Christ died for the ungodly. It's interesting that that word weak or helpless, ostenes in Greek, sometimes also means sick. It means being completely helpless. And that's sometimes what happens when you're sick, right? When you get sick, it's hard to get up out of bed. It's, you become weak, and it's hard to do things. And we be, are weakened and corrupted by sin. That's what sin does to us. Without Christ, we're weakened and helpless in so many different ways. And I believe the Bible teaches that we're corrupted intellectually. That's what happened in this passage. When you profess to be wise without God, the, ta the, the, the text says that we become fools. It affects us morally. We're all corrupted and twisted by sin and reflects us relationally, relationally as well. When sin comes between us and God, it also becomes a problem between us and other people as well, and it affects us most of all spiritually. You know, it's kind of like being in the desert. You ever been in the desert before or a place like the desert? You know, some people say that West Texas is the desert. I don't know if that's, uh, that's probably kind of... Yeah, yeah, some of you have seen it. I mean, there's not a whole lot out there. There's not a lot of water. And the things they call mesquite trees are actually what they, I guess they can get to be about big. But there, some people call them bushes just because there's not a whole lot of water out there. But you ever notice what happens when you're in the desert after it rains? Instead of, you know, skulls and dust and skeletons and you start seeing little blossoms and stuff and color just uh, flip, just pop up all over the place. And that's kind of the way it is without God. We're just a dry desert, but when God comes in, well, life springs up all over in our lives, and life is only possible through Jesus, who gives us the living water. God has given us life in the fullest possible sense. Jesus said, I am the bread of life in John chapter 6, and if we eat of this bread, then we'll live and never die. Jesus also said he would be the one that gives us living water. Jesus also said, I am the good shepherd, and I've come that they may have life and have it abundantly. And what that means is that in Christ, we have an abundance of everything that we truly need. With the water of life, we have, we have life and we flourish in ways that really matter. We have riches 
that aren't affected by who's in office or economic downturns or anything like that. We become rich in ways that really matter. We become better spouses. We become better children. We become better parents. We become better teachers. We become better employees, better neighbors. We grow in peace and in true prosperity, contentment, and joy. Oh yes, we have plenty to give thanks to God for in our lives. And we should do that, not just privately, but publicly as well. I always appreciate it when somebody puts a a thanksgiving on the prayer list. Uh, We need to give God thanks as much as we bring our requests. With thanksgiving, let our requests be made known to God, the Bible says. And so it transforms our perception. And number two, go to the next slide. It can transform our relationship with others. When we make thanksgiving a practice, it helps us to regard others in a more godly and a more positive way. You know, the text we read said that in their, when they rejected God and thought they were wise without God, in their lust and in their desire, it says they were given over to impurity. See, when you take God out of the mix, relationships are no longer pure. In fact, nothing is pure. And it manifests itself in so many ugly ways. And the text we read mentioned several. Well, one of the ones... uh, The thing that's meant to be lovely, the thing that's meant to be pure and beautiful between a husband and a wife becomes twisted. And without God at the center, it becomes a reflection of self-centeredness rather than a reflection of the beauty of God. And sometimes people even wind up using other people for their selfish purposes. And there are many other characteristics of depravity, and the text mentions quite a few of them. Some of these ugly behaviors, slander, uh, greed, envy, murder, strife, deceit, disobedient to parents, boastful, and on and on and on and on. And why did all of this happen? Because they didn't honor God as God, and they did not give thanks to Him. See, when we acknowledge God as God and we make thanksgiving a way of life, it transforms the way we see other people. Because the Bible reminds us that every single one of us, every single human being, has been created in the image of God. Have you thought about what that really means? Being created in the image of the one who created us. That means that every single one of us are worthy of inherent dignity. Every single one of us have inherent beauty. Every single one of us are worthy to be treated with respect and with compassion and with kindness because every single human being has been created in the image of God. But not everyone acknowledges God or gives Him thanks. And it affects our personal relationships one with another, with family, in our community, and even in the world around us. You know, this reminds me of a person I know, oh, it's been some years ago when he was dating a girl, and the girl's family did not like this guy. Matter of fact, they did everything they could to try and keep the two of them apart. The parents tried to keep them apart, and at one point the guy said, you know, there's nothing you can do to keep us apart. And it became evident that two of them were going to be married whether they liked it or not. And once they got married, they said, you need to stop this. You know, they're married, we need to support them, and we need to do everything we can to to strengthen their relationship because they are together. And you know, he wasn't a very good husband at first. He was kind of domineering and and, uh, demanding, and uh, sometimes he was even verbally uh, abusive. And, and they never had any money because he didn't really never had a very good job. Uh, he dropped out of college. He wanted to become a professional soccer player on his team that was trying to become a professional soccer team. And all the other players on the team had money from their families, but uh, this guy didn't have any money. And uh, so it seemed like uh, that they never had any money, and, my, and, and this girl had to work and try and provide for them, and never had very much. And then several key things happened in his life. Number one, he became a Christian and eventually he went with a friend to a Promise promise Keepers rally. I don't know if you remember those back when they were a big thing. And uh, He came back and realized after being there that, you know, I've not really been a very good husband. 
Um, and he came back and he confessed in front of the entire church and said, you know, I, I confess to being a poor husband. And I vowed today to be a better husband and a more godly husband. And then he and his wife went to a His Needs, Her Needs seminar. I think they call them dynamic marriage nowadays. Um, and it transformed their relationship. And one of the things that's very different about him now than then was at that time he was always kind of in a little bit of a kind of a sour mood. Things weren't going well in his life. Really wasn't a whole lot to be uh, thankful for. But now he's given... Uh, he's given uh, he's given now all that up for something much better. And he talks regularly about how God has blessed him. He now has several children. He's a godly husband. They have wonderful children. And uh, he regularly talks about how good God has been to them. And he gives thanks to God. And one of the ways he does that is by sharing financial blessings with other people. God has blessed me and I just want to share it with you uh, as well. And that attitude of thanksgiving... I am convinced has helped to sustain the change that we've all seen in his life. Transformed his relationships. You wouldn't recognize the man now from the man then. When we acknowledge God with thanksgiving as a lifestyle, it transforms our relationships. And the more we give thanks habitually, the more we change. We become less focused on ourselves, more focused on God, and more focused on others. Truly, it helps to transform our relationships. And that brings us to the last point. It helps to transform, especially, our relationship with God. Now, I want to do something with this passage. We know Pastor Romans is talking about those who refused to acknowledge God as God and did not give thanks to God. Talking about unbelievers. But look at all of these descriptions and recognize that the opposite of those descriptions are, is talking about us, then you get a picture of what we as God's people are like. And so, starting with verse 21, I'm going to go ahead and go through this again and read it as though it were written to believers, the opposite of the description that we see in the text. And so I went ahead and put it on the screen and we go ahead and uh, uh, follow along here. They knew God and honored him as God, and were giving thanks and became fruitful in their meditations. And their wise heart was enlightened. Humbly professing their inability before God, they grew in wisdom. Therefore God brought them near in the desire of their heart to purity, so that they would be honorable and holy to the Lord. For they exchanged the lie of the world for the truth of God and worshiped and served the Creator and not the creature who is blessed forever. Amen. For this, re for this reason, God was transforming their passions so that they reflected the beauty and glory of God in their relationships with one another. As they continued to acknowledge God, God gave them a sound mind to do the things which are proper being filled with all righteousness, goodness, generosity, virtue, full of goodwill, renewal, peace, honesty, benevolent. They are honorable in speech, speaking what is truth, lovers of God. They are respectable, humble, modest, inventors of good, obedient to parents, wise, trustworthy, loving, merciful, and they know the ordinances of God that those who practice these things are worthy of life. They not only do these things, but encourage others to do the same. Isn't that a fantastic picture of what God's people can be like when they honor Him as God and make thanksgiving a lifestyle reminds us of the way God blesses us when we do the things that he instructs us to do. Somebody once said that envy, envy is resenting God's goodness to others and ignoring God's goodness to me. To say that, read that again. Envy is resenting God's goodness to others and ignoring God's goodness to me. 
And I think all of us know and probably have seen and maybe even experienced ourselves how envy can destroy our relationship with others and it can destroy our relationship with God as well. But you know what? The practice of thanksgiving can help to combat envy. When you make thanksgiving a daily and regular practice, it helps to combat, combat and get rid of the envy out of your heart and help you to draw closer to God and draw closer to others as well. Thanksgiving is a practice that deepens our relationship with God. It decreases pride, and pride is what separates us from God, and it allows God to rule our lives. We have a lot of things to be thankful for, and if you're listing them already, then continue to do so, and do it every day. The first words out of our mouth every day when we wake up in the morning ought to be, thank you, Lord. And the last words out of our mouth before we go to bed ought to be, thank you, Lord. Be specific in the things that we thank God for. And it's amazing how the more we do that, the more God changes our perspective. You know, the greatest thing we have to be thankful for, we're reminded of by the, what we see on the wall right over here. Redemption through Jesus Christ Sin separated us from God. Sin came between us and God, and God gave the very best that He could for you to provide a way back to God. Jesus came to earth and He died on the cross for our sins, was buried and rose up from the grave. We know that He's coming back again someday. And if you accept that and you're ready to accept Jesus' rule over your life and you're ready to, uh, ready to be baptized, the uh, water is over in the other building and it's always ready. <laughs> uh, but the water is always ready and if you need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can go down to the water and He'll wash away all of your sins and you'll be a child of God. And the blessings will always, the blessings will always outweigh the non-blessings. You know, Charles Spurgeon once said, saying thank you is what separates man from animals. Saying thank you is what separates man from animals. You've seen that, right? When you feed the dog, the dog never says thank you. I mean, they enjoy it, and you enjoy watching the dog enjoy it, but the dog never comes up, comes over and says, you know what, I thank you very much for all the things that you do for me. Um, we contemplate, and God has given the ability to contemplate all the things that God has blessed us with, and we give thanks to Him for that because we have been created in the image of God. We're going to go ahead and sing a song in just a moment. And uh, I want to invite you to consider how you respond to this lesson. I'm going to leave this up here because the battery, I think, is dead in the uh, handheld. And uh, if you need to respond, please do so.